Hello and welcome to the Cricket News Podcast Season 4, a Hub Hopper original and we are here. We are finally here. I am Rahul Pandey and I'll be your guide to this big, exciting and full of twists and turns ride of the T20 season ahead. A season that will be concluded with the big T20 World Cup final. So I'm pretty much sure that it isn't just me who's calling this the mega T20 season. Anyways, I would like to thank you all before we begin, and this is most important before we begin the podcast, before we begin the first podcast of this season, I'd like to thank you all for the amazing support and the love that you have showered on us. We reached the million mark last season around, and so if you're listening to us right now, and if you are even watching us, you are one in a million, and For it to stay the same, you'll have to stay tuned to the Cricket News podcast uh, the whole season this time around. So I'm pretty much sure that's what you're going to do. We've had quite the list of topics sorted out, quite the list of esteemed guests who will be joining us to make this a remarkable experience for you and to make sure that this isn't the only voice and this isn't the only face that you are going to see this season. But if you are to see other faces and hear other voices, you will have to see this face and hear this voice. Okay, enough of me. Let's talk about the first guest of this season, cricket broadcasting. Well, that is something which has always fascinated me and made me scratch my hair to think about the hundred different ways it can be done. But I'm pretty much sure if, and even if you haven't scratched your hair so far, you have also had the childlike fascination which I share for this stream of cricket for this particular aspect of cricket. Well, in that case, we have someone who can tell you about the details of the big process. He is someone who has worked with Star as a cricket producer for almost seven years now. And even currently, as we speak, as I speak, is working on the Caribbean Premier League. He also happens to be a cricket fan, which doesn't sound peculiar at all, given his designation. So, I'm going to try and pick his brains as a producer and as a fan. So without further ado, let's start the first episode of the Cricket News Podcast Season 4 on producing cricket with Saran Bhalerao. Welcome. I have been joined now by Mr. Saran Bhalerao. Sir, first question to you. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. I mean, I was very happy when India won at loss. So now I think I'm quite okay. Of course, we're going to get into the details of the same. We're not going to let you go without putting you into some tough spots about the India series as well. But before that, good to hear that you're doing well. And what's what's been cricket like to you for the last one month or so? Because uh, the reason why this becomes all the more a delicious question is because I believe there's been so much variety in, in our sport to consume with a very tasty new addition in the form of the 100. We have, of course, had the 100 in England. We've had test cricket in England and as well in the Caribbean. Also, the Caribbean Premier League has kicked off. We've also had the T20 World Cup 2023 qualifiers in Europe. So, a lot of cricket to consume. How's it been for you as a fan of the game to watch so much of variety in the recent past? Uh, Yeah, Rahul, you're right. There's a lot of variety. The 100 was uh, quite a novel concept, which uh, we just wanted to see how it pans out. The talks were on for many years. So, finally... uh, we have another format, uh, but for statisticians, it's just a T20 game. So there, there's no classification for statisticians. But apart from that, we've seen some high quality cricket. Good to see uh, a lot of competition. And uh, yeah, as a fan, it can get a little difficult to keep track of everything. But uh, you know, good to see a uh, few good performances. And uh, just as everything will culminate to the T20 World Cup, it's good to see some exciting talent emerging. For example, Liam Livingston, uh, I think, uh, is one name which promises a lot. So, I think uh, that excitement has been generated and there's lots of uh, 
quality cricket in offer and it's uh, been quite uh, good as far as a cricket fan is concerned definitely definitely and now nicely transitioning from the consumer bit because i know you would want to answer mm-hmm. that this bit as well to you being the distributor and packager of the sport in that you being the producer how's the variety for you been from the technical stand view of a producer well pr- production is uh, now we are producing caribbean premier league the other matches we are not producing but uh, yeah from the point of view of uh, distributors if i can talk uh, in general and not uh, the specific uh, role that i am in uh, it's quite interesting the way cricket is being uh, is being produced gone are the days when there were just two cameras now you have plenty of new things coming so to educate the audience you have to uh, be very very uh, creative with the graphics you have to almost tell keep the screen busy you yeah. have to have sort of excitement there is a lot of analytics which is uh, a part of the game which hither though was just a uh, which was confined to the dressing rooms but now the tactical bits are discussed staying ahead of the game is one of the ways by which you can engage the audience so from that viewpoint i think what i'm quite enjoying and every Uh, buddy seems to be picking that up is staying ahead of the game calling the big moments and yeah. creating anticipation so all those things i think uh, are quite enriching uh, from the viewpoint of the audience and uh, uh, it i think adds a new dimension uh, to cricket viewing experience yeah they certainly do and uh, for me even the the, the first bit of teaser at the 100 the first game itself the first reveal was so different because as a kid who sort of adored the game from his very early years to to watch number of balls being you know the only the, the only way to look at the game rather than number of overs was was a whole new different game altogether and and in that you know there's this question as to what have you enjoyed watching the most because in this variety you have had people who have mm-hmm. enjoyed the 100 probably you know the age group the number of people who went to watch the games in england was was an eye opener for the people in of england itself but uh, i think i know the answer from your end but i want to hear from you what have you enjoyed most in the recent past yeah obviously test cricket i think nothing beats test cricket Yeah. the ebbs and flows and uh, the very fact that you can always make a comeback in test cricket makes it quite uh, uh, engaging format to watch now the 100 and t20 cricket you more or less know that if a team scores in excess of 250 more or less the team is going to win uh, in 20 overs if they score 250 and uh, test cricket is one format which uh, has found ways to survive because it is very tough you know uh, there are phases where everything is stacked against you but how can you conquer uh, the field how how tactically strong you are um, if your technique is not good enough you will be exposed so to excel uh, and keep playing uh, at an average of say 50 which which is very difficult i feel and taking wickets consistently so i think test cricket is one format which i think even after thousands of years i am very sure that it will find its way to survive uh, the 100 t20 uh, the the relatively newer uh, formats but i think test cricket is one format which i definitely enjoy watching did someone supply to you my next question because you already answered it which was in the sense that when we put the broadcasting game on the table and everyone knows mm-hmm. it it has changed cricket forever there's no two ways about it the way people have you know taken to the, the, the game and you know the way things have changed from the times when my father was growing up it's it's just mind boggling to see where the game is right now and it's something highly unusual for one team sport to have this kind of a variety where there's a format that goes as long as 5 days and a format which goes a uh, as less than a football match now that we have this new younger edition as well in terms of the broadcasting sense do you think all of that can be put forth for the people 
coming forward who are taking to the game as a new sport for them do you think all of that can survive and coexist together in the years to come yeah i think uh, the reason why t20 cricket was introduced was it was more of a viewing experience for people to uh, do their 9 to 5 jobs and yeah come and uh, experience cricket and uh, take it as entertainment so i think cricket is going to evolve the formats are going to evolve it's what the audience wants to consume that uh, i think that's where uh, you see the uh, companies and uh, the the money is flowing over there because it's just a uh, sort of uh, 3 hour experience which you're selling you're not just it's not just about watching the game it's about uh, the experiences it's about uh, seeing uh, the replays on the big screen uh, supporting your uh, favorite team so there is a lot there is industry uh, which caters to uh, the fans of a particular club yeah so i think it's all coming together the reason why i think the shorter formats are going to uh, be consumed more is because that gets a lot of other countries uh, a chance to compete it it is it, it has that inclusiveness for example if cricket were to be introduced in the olympic games it yeah. can't be test format it has to be a shorter version so yeah. that's how you can get more countries uh, uh, in in the competing and playing the format and there's nothing wrong with uh, different formats coming together because i think the game of cricket uh, you know it, it's so engaging and it uh, caters to almost everyone it, now for example the my father's generation they still mm. prefer to watch test cricket but younger generation wants to see uh, big hits and action packed uh, cricket so i think uh, there is a bit for everyone to enjoy and there is high quality cricket that's happening so yeah, which is actually the most important thing uh, the competitive uh, nature of the sport you know i would like to think that in a year like 2021 when test cricket has given us so many incredible moments and not just talking about this from an indian fan perspective but also for say the current recently concluded west indies versus pakistan series even if we talk about west indies to to bangladesh um it was just high quality cricket at its best test cricket at its best games going on to day 5 and then the climax which is what we all await for for those long 5 days has been sort of a good trailer and advertisement for the sport even for the countries who are following who are, who are not probably playing it at the highest level but do want to follow it i, I remember watching uh, the brazil women's cricket team captain uh, she tweeted during the wtc final that at least during this weather in england when the game a day is being washed out you can probably host it in brazil which is a nice destination and it seemed like quite the advertisement for the sport so so that's been pretty good in 2021 i think uh, with, with the test cricket where it is right now and the way we have this series poised up at one all i think we can only expect it to go even longer and and you're absolutely right that in the sense that a generation such as ours which has the option to turn up to t20 or the 100 is also loving the bigger format of the game as they do with these new shorter formats right then but coming on to your story now you entered the broadcast scene at a very exciting time i remember the the period between 2016 to 2017 when i was in college it it was the sort of time when the internet in a big way changed the way we consume the sport changed where we consume the sport i mean even if you look now this focus and and rightly so a good amount of focus on what the internet says even if you are watching the game on a television even if you are watching the pre match show on television what's been the experience like for you during this timeline when you saw the shift what are the changes that you witnessed from close quarters being the producer well uh, to be quite honest uh, the internet is just one small part the broadcasting you reach out to uh, millions of people but internet if you see they're not millions of views it's just a fraction of uh, the reach of television but i yeah. do understand where you're coming from uh, it's a sort of instant feedback 
sort of mechanism where people instantly react to something which they maybe yeah. like or dislike or want or uh, they want to have their opinion on certain uh, moments within the game so i think in that way uh, gauging the internet is is quite a good feedback to have but uh, it's just a small part uh, if you have, if i want to answer this it's not something which drives the way broadcast is done but it's just a helping uh, tool it just gives us one perspective uh, so i think uh, social media is the next big thing if it already isn't but uh, to include a lot of people now you can see zoom calls and uh, various other the technology enables people to join real time yeah. uh, if you want to hear someone's side of the story if you want to uh, get any reaction i think it's, it's it has become far more easier so i think the next challenge is how you can uh, dovetail technology uh, the timing and integrate it in say the shows or the production so that's going to be the next big challenge and uh, be rest assured that technology keeps changing every 3 or 4 years yeah it does it does and even with the formats changing i think the technology is the one that will have to keep up but uh, i remember this and this is you know uh, about a game in, in a general sense gives us a gist about cricket that i remember a conversation with a spanish journalist last year and uh, we were sort of talking about football but quickly moved on to cricket which is what he wanted to know about he wasn't aware of the game so i did what i could have done best to promote test cricket for him and for someone who grew up watching football uh, a sport which is played over 90 minutes if you want to take the time off you can go to the penalties then but for for him it was a scrappy but helpful explainer for my end i can vouch for the fact that i did my best to convince him that it's it's a great sport you must watch it but there's the thing about the game we've grown watching it adoring it but still for a lot of people around it it isn't as easy to grasp as it is for us for say if we are talking about someone who's being exposed to test cricket for the first instance what do you think you know how are the changes that can work that can be worked out to make it a good experience for him or her if he or she is watching this big format of the game what are the changes you think as a producer that can be done to the broadcast if we are talking about exposing the oldest format of the game the arguably the most complex format of the game to a new set of audiences well uh, this is actually very tough i mean to explain the nuances of the game yeah uh, yeah i mean football is pretty straightforward the only yeah. sort of thing that people may struggle to understand if they are uh, watching it for the first time is the offside for example yeah uh, certain penalty uh, red card yellow card so there are there are very few such things which they can grasp easily but cricket per se is very complicated in the sense that uh, why is a bats why is batsman not out if the ball pitches outside leg stump so it is very difficult to explain it is very difficult to explain uh, uh you know i have been asked this question uh, uh should draws exist or should we have a timeless format now there are very uh, there are questions unanswered and this will keep evolving but uh, the most important thing as broadcasters is to follow the action now we are taking a you know unbiased stance on what is happening it's for the icc to uh, change the rules for us it's pretty simple we have to action is happening we have to call the action we have to tell stories during broadcast and that's what i think is is a form of storytelling now yeah. are you in tune with the story uh in the sense that if you don't know the laws of the game it is very difficult for a broadcaster to explain to give a dummy's guide because there is an assumption that people who are watching the game are fans of the game they know the laws of the game 
and if there are some exceptional laws like for example there are laws which gets modified you do modify laws like uh, uh like for example uh you know there, there was a law when even if your bat is in the air after it crossed the crease initially you were given out but now that law has been changed so if there are so, these kind of modifications then i think it makes sense to delve deep into the laws of the game but apart from that i think the most important thing is to tell stories is to call the action and uh, to just follow the way the match is going i understand if somebody is watching the game for the first time it may be a little difficult to uh, win that person over in the sense uh, because then you know there 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 are a lot of things that if we start doing that the analytical part then will take a back seat the strategic part will take a back seat so at no point do we want to compromise on that and the experts are experts because they add a lot of value when it comes to strategies and uh, when it comes to staying ahead of the game so that's why they are there so i think that's the speciality so i think to answer your question it's a little difficult i understand it's a little complicated format to explain the lbw laws i was once asked by someone uh, why if a batsman if the batsman doesn't offer a shot and if he struck outside the line of the off stump and if it's hitting the stumps why is he given out so these are some of the laws which uh, uh, you possibly have to uh, understand that there are laws uh, like that in the game of cricket and you just have to follow the action that's what i feel as far as football and cricket both are concerned as a sport the relatability factor for them in the current era might be var and empire score because they both create a lot of controversies in the modern sport yeah. a controversy is that we help become big yeah. but there's there's this there's, there's this good point that you've uh, come up with here which is that you don't want to compromise with the analytical side of the game because uh the focus might then be on the larger chunk of audience who are used to the format and who are the people who you want to cater to but then on the other hand now if we have a tournament like the t20 world cup which is a big ticket tournament the men's t20 world cup will be played for the first time after 5 years 5 long years now mm-hmm. when you are to present that sort of a tournament to a large audience which you guys will be to it it is going to be a different ball game altogether for for people who are going to watch their teams who may be featuring for the first time it will be a different thing to consume that sport maybe even more so than uh, us consuming the sport in india so how does that change when we talk about the world feed when we talk about this big tournament do we then focus on how to best tell stories about the team that is involved or do we then just go back to the analytical side and or do we just get into a compromise between both these situations i think analytics and all you can't plan you just have to observe and react but yeah. uh, i think hero building is very important like you have to tell stories like for example in india you do not have to tell back stories of uh, our cricketers we seem to know everything about everyone but when it comes to some other teams what is it that is an engaging story is the story about someone who wanted to give up cricket but something happened to him and he chose to pick cricket and he chose cricket over the other sport and now you know he is uh, doing good for example such stories have to be told about a player not compromising what is happening out there in the middle so my simple answer to this is it's uh, hero building number one about other teams when it comes to india it's about say india pakistan rivalry so that will take care of itself there is a lot of history uh, the head to heads for example if someone comes to bat is bouncer a good option first up is bowling off spin a good option first up so so you almost have to pick a story uh, and it it has to be a little prescriptive as well as well as descriptive so i think if when that sort of happens for big matches 
you tend to get a lot of involvement. But for the teams who are, uh, say, at a world stage, uh, the audience may not be knowing a lot about some players. So the simple answer to that is, what's the current form of the player? What's his reputation? What are his favorite shots? How is he playing the innings? So the style of narration might change. So at all times, we have to tell stories, but the tools are different in every story. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's obviously a tough task as I'd like to think because in live cricket, things change in split seconds and that's when you have to react. But then it's it's a job that you guys do very nicely and i'm looking forward to the t20 world cup coverage but before that we of course have talked about the current the ongoing england india series it's one all and just like that england have made a comeback in this series no one really expected this sort of a comeback after that final day at lords it's easier for a team to submit to the opposition after you lose in that fashion but the way england made a comeback has just made it all the more exciting to watch the next two tests now, for you, what has been the most impressive aspect when we talk about this Indian team? Of course, there are going to be sections such as the openers gelling well together. We have had KL Rahul and Rohit Sharma almost feeling like they've, they've been born to play in these conditions. Even though there have been quick dismissals, they've almost every time made sure that they stay on in the middle for as long as they can. But then there's this mouth mouthwatering prospect of India's fast ball, which has been in the news since I remember 2018, that South Africa series. Now, what's been what's what's changed as far as this fast bowling is concerned in, in, in your in your viewpoint? Fast four years. You, sorry. I'm just talking about the revolution fast. as such from to the 2018 series to current to okay. the current fast bowling yeah. attack. No, no, there, there are a lot of options. Uh, we have bowlers for all conditions. Uh, and uh, for the first time, we have, uh, I mean, as far as I can remember, because uh, in the 90s, it was just two fast bowlers. Third pacer was an understudy and spin bowlers. So it was very difficult. Uh, uh, so a lot of captains of the past are quite... Uh, they, they, they wondered what the results would have been if such riches of such rich fast bowling was available to them. So we no doubt have one of the best bowling attacks in the world. India is blessed to have uh, the bowlers. And I think the workload management also is an aspect which uh, you know, adds to the longevity of these bowlers. It's good to see uh, bowlers taking rest and uh, you know, hence they are planning for the series ahead and that's why everybody is in top shape. So I think evolution in terms of skill, evolution in terms of resting the bowlers, about uh, outwitting the batsmen, having variety in the attack. Uh, we don't, we no longer have two line and length bowlers and one pacer. Everybody has that variation. Everybody has their identity when it comes to bowling. So if the ball reverses, we have bowlers who can exploit the conditions. If they swing on offer, we have bowlers to pick wickets. So I think uh, we are blessed to have such an attack. And having said that, I think it will only uh, get better from you. Yeah. yeah. And which player has impressed you the most? Uh, Jaspreet Bumra, because simply for the fact that uh, for simple reason, he was a surprise pick for the South Africa tour, if I remember, in 2018. And uh, everyone was wondering if uh, Bumra would succeed in red ball cricket. Because there was uh, he had done exceptionally well in white ball cricket. So there were doubts. But he had bowled quite a bit for Gujarat before he was uh, the IPL star that we uh, labelled him as back then in white ball cricket uh, specialist. But he had bowled a lot of uh, spells for Gujarat. I was fortunate to see a few of them when he was a young bowler. Always had that awkward action and uh, would do something or the other. I mean, uh, hot afternoon, he had uh, 
Yorker as a surprise weapon. He would bowl short balls. He would he would do bowl cutters. So he he was a thinking bowler even back then when he was quite young. So I think uh, the evolution of Bumrah uh, as a Test bowler was uh, because he had done uh, done a lot of bowling for Gujarat and he knew. Uh, Different. I mean, you when you see him bowling slower balls and outwitting the batsman, I've seen him do that uh, in domestic cricket. So it's just that he is he's quite a special talent, and I think he has been one of the finds for India. Hello, this is just a little breather for you before we bombard you again with lots and lots of cricket content. But while you're at it and while you're taking those deep breaths, do make sure that you subscribe to the Cricket News YouTube channel and hit the bell icon near it. I'm watching you as you do it. So I'll wait. Come on now, do it. We can't proceed forward when we are talking about test cricket in England without mentioning the draw in June. On the 16th of June, the test match began between England women and India women. There were lots of questions being asked about the Indian team as well, not having the practice that is required ahead of playing a test match in England. But they answered all of that to our faces by that valiant draw. And that's the kind of thing which India needed exactly in this year because we have another big test match coming in Australia. Pink ball test, the first pink ball test of Indian women's team. How excited are you about that prospect going to Australia and playing a series against them this year? Well, I'm actually excited to see women playing the longer format. I think uh, what has happened is this test match that happened uh, against England uh, was after seven years. So it's a long time. We have uh, quite a good uh, number of quality players who need to, uh, who need the test cricket to excel. I mean, for example, Mitali Raj, uh, she first announced herself after scoring 214 against uh, England. Uh, when she was a youngster. So I think when you notch up such performances in test cricket, uh, it also is a wonderful opportunity to show your skills. I mean, uh, the saying goes, if you're a good cricketer, you you will perform well in test cricket. So I think I'm very happy that uh, BCCI took the initiative of uh, announcing test matches against uh, England and Australia. And uh, this is going to be a big one against Australia. I'm quite excited to first see how Smriti Mandana, Shafali Varma, uh, they play in Australia because I am sure that they would enjoy batting on those pitches, a little quick pitches, and it, it aids to the shot making. You can play a lot of uh, horizontal bat shots. So I think that's something which I'm very excited to see. I want to. Uh, see who's the fast bowler who would fill in Julian Goswami's shoes when she retires. So I think these are all uh, exciting times. Uh, to play Australia in Australia is a daunting task, but I'm very sure that uh, after the spirited draw against England, and mind you, we India got off to a very good start. The opening partnership was yeah. uh, good, but uh, there was this middle-order collapse and uh, suddenly India were very, very behind uh, and they actually struggled in that game. But uh, good to see someone like Snehrana, who is a consistent performer for Railways for many years, getting a due, uh, batting uh, well. I was a little disappointed not to see her scoring uh, 100 in the second innings. Uh, the match was called off, but it would have been such a good thing if uh, someone like Snehrana got 100 on debut. So all the debutants did well. So it just goes on to show that there is a lot of talent uh, in India. And I think they need uh, a platform to express the talent. And uh, nothing better than test cricket to showcase uh, the skills that you've got. This discussion, and, and, and you've given a fair bit of pointers as to why we can rely on the near future. But this discussion, and it's an important one, which is that of women's cricket, and how things have changed over the years. I mean, I remember the 2017 World Cup final because I was interning with the Broadcast News Media House and I remember the experience of that one night. Even though India lost, 
but it sort of seemed like this was the night that we needed in Indian cricket. This was the night that women's cricket needed as a whole. But now four years later, and while India and every other team is preparing for the big ticket event, which is next year, do you think we have made even more progress after that night? Uh, to be quite honest, I am not really happy with the progress, if you ask me. Uh, because okay. uh, the, as in that women's cricket has grown, but if you talk about the one-day team, Indian team still has issues with regards to uh, scoring 250 plus. So I think which is one of the issues which uh, what we had uh, imagined Indian cricket, uh, the direction that the women's cricket would take would, would have been of world beaters, probably uh, second best team, say, after Australia or England. But what has happened is there are a lot of issues in the uh, one-day team in the sense that India is struggling to find a finisher with just one year to go for the World Cup. Uh, I think the best 11 is still not in place. So when you compare that with, say, the other teams, the, the other teams sort of have an idea of how to approach. Uh, they have the big players. India had this issue of uh, middle overs accelerating. Uh, Mittali Raj takes time, Poonam Raj. So when, the bo when both of them batted together, the run rate would go down. So I think there are a few issues. So I expect India to get in Richa Ghosh, for example, in, in um, the one-day format. One of the finishers could be Veda Krishnamurti. So, I think what what this team still needs to do is identify the balanced eleven, give them a consistent run because uh, India we do not want a situation where we are in the World Cup and we are yet not clear about the eleven. So, to be honest, I think it was a mind-boggling performance by the women's team. I think they deserve to win the 2017 World Cup, but. Uh, I think pressure got to them. Uh, suddenly, um, the collapse ensued and what uh, would have been dream come true for everyone, it uh, wasn't to be. So, I think uh, the, and, and, having, and knowing Miltali Raj and Julan Goswami, they badly want to win the World Cup. And yeah. India does have the team, I feel. It's just that getting that 11 uh, balanced 11 and the unit playing a lot of matches and there are not a lot of matches before the World Cup so I think this team has it in them but if you ask me the progress I'm a little disappointed with uh, how the uh, one day team or the one day progress of the team it could have been better but it's uh, still work in progress as far as uh, I'm concerned and how about the experience of watching the growth as someone who has worked in, clo in close quarters as far as the broadcasting of women's cricket is concerned. How's that progress been for you? Fantastic. I mean, uh, I was uh, covering games in Surat, uh, India, South Africa, women's uh, games. And it was so heartening to see full houses. Every single game, people would turn up. They had uh, banners. Uh, uh, about uh, banners on the their favorite cricketers. So it was something which I had not really seen. Uh, and it was quite a good thing to see. And uh, with the, the, the thing is the growth in terms of broadcasting is, is that has happened, yes. You see women's cricket being televised, which wasn't the case uh, a few years back. They would only uh, you would only see the ICC events uh, being covered. So now what has happened is a lot of interest in women's cricketers. You see uh, uh, women cricketer being discussed, the exceptional talent being discussed, like Jemima Rodriguez, for example. Uh, exceptional player. And uh, I, I saw one... Um, feature Sky Sports did on uh, Jemima when Nasir Hussain was talking to her and, and it, was, it was quite good to see. Uh, 
Harmanpreet Kaur, the her story uh, is is something which uh, inspires me. Coming from small town of Moga, playing with uh, uh, the the guys and scoring runs against them. Smriti Mandhana, the kind of talent. I, I, I don't know if you know, she scored a double hundred in uh, under nineteen uh, cricket using yeah. Rahul Dravid's yeah. bat. So there are such such anecdotes and these these. I mean, interest generated today uh, about uh, these women cricketers, which I think people now know what what's the ability of a women cricketer. What they are getting into the strategic bits also the audience. So that's that's something interesting. A growth of Mitali Raj, uh, who continues to be an inspiration. So what has happened is, uh, you know, in broadcast you you get to see them play. you get to see a lot of support and when the team loses you also see disappointment so people genuinely want the audience and people genuinely want the team to do well and there is a lot of interest uh, around women's cricket and i have seen as i mentioned uh, people uh, turn up in huge numbers to watch uh, even uh, in lucknow when south africa had come this year uh, or there was there was lot of crowd and there was lot of interest uh, which which i could see yeah no no and we certainly hope that this is a trajectory which only goes upwards but now coming on to an exciting addition in this year's cricket news podcast which is where we try and put all our guests in the tough spot and i'm going to try and my, uh, try my best to do that with you a rapid fire round with some of the questions in which you will be asked to give your view points some may be a little a little bit subjective but then again that's the fun part of the game so we'll start with the easy ones first cricket match that you watched international or domestic any cricket match which you remember watching the first cricket match that you watched uh... Yeah, I, I think it was uh, Mumbai playing Baroda. Yeah, nineteen ninety four, ninety five Ranji Trophy season. Um, Sachin scored hundred and seventy five in that match. If I'm not wrong, it was in Chembur, RCF Ground, Chembur. So that was uh, I was I was a seven year old. So I I do remember that what bits and pieces of that match. Uh, but the one match i remember watching was sachin's uh, double hundred the first maiden double hundred that he scored against australia at cci just before the 98 tour just before uh, 155 that he got against uh, uh, australia so i remember watching that match uh, quite clearly and i was cheering um, as i was speaking sachin's name and jumping uh, <laughs> when he when he hit boundaries and sixes in that game so that's i think first couple of games i remember which yes yes and the first cricket match that he produced oh that's a tough one uh generally you do remember such matches but uh, it was the karnataka premier league that i produced uh, uh, okay. in in 2017 yeah, around that time yes did you have any jitters in the legs sort of feeling when we were you were just prepping up to produce that game okay this is the first one no not really i mean uh, understandably uh, there are some jitters but when you are in the action mode you don't really have time to think about how nervous you are or what could go wrong you, you just do your work and i think uh, that's one good thing that you continue doing your work and Uh, generally, you stop working only after the match ends. So that's it. fair. Fair enough. And favorite childhood cricketer. Who's the first cricketer you put up on the pedestal as a child? Uh, Sachin Tendulkar, because uh, I, I was quite fascinated by uh, his uh, aura back then. and uh, kind of innings that he used to play uh, initial years he would play breezy knocks in one day cricket it wasn't uh, uh, wasn't scoring big but in test cricket i think the way he could punch a fast bowler on the back foot or play the straight drive 
Hmm. I think that was unmatched, and uh, I just simply loved to copy him and um, mimic him. And Didn't we all? So, Didn't. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so, so yeah. So that, that that's uh, my memories of, of idolizing Sachin. So, which is your favorite Sachin innings? And now this is surely the kind of question everyone has a different answer to, tries and have a different answer to. But was which is the one you remember most fondly? Uh, well, obviously there are a lot of innings, but uh, one innings I liked uh, Sachin was uh, the Cape Town hundred, where he scored one sixty nine with India five down for fifty odd, um, staring down the barrel. Uh, the partnership of two twenty two, if I'm not wrong, between him and Azharuddin. I think that was quality innings. Uh, yeah. I'm sure there are a lot of others. I, like I, I also enjoyed uh, 136, which India lost uh, against Pakistan. That was quite a special innings on a turning pitch. Yeah. Uh, these are uh, a few. I mean, there, there are lots of innings, like uh, 175 against Australia in one day, uh, Hyderabad one day, is double hundred uh, against South Africa. So. Just to tell you one innings, uh, if I had to tell, I would tell 98 against Pakistan, which India won uh, in Centurion, which was not his 100. He didn't score 100 in that game, but 98 of 75. Boy, what an innings that was. Yeah. He, 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 he hammered Pakistan bowlers. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and what is on that note your favorite memory of cricket as a child? A cricket match, or perhaps a result that you weren't expecting? Uh, well, uh, as a child, I just used to uh, play cricket, enjoy whatever I could get to watch. And uh, well, this was. Uh, not really an international match, but I won a match for my club as a child. I was a, a eight-year-old cricketer. I scored some thirty-odd runs, and we won the match. And I remember my father buying a pair of jeans. So I think that uh, was quite uh, memorable personally. And then uh, during that summer camp, someone introduced me to this Kanga Library. So I'm extremely thankful to. Uh, late Dr. Vazir, who was a chief guest, and he, uh, I enrolled, uh, I took the membership of the library, and that, I think, after doing that, I started reading a lot about the game, and even till today, I read quite a lot, so I think that one habit, uh, uh, I think, of reading, because of cricket, because I was playing uh, for my club, so that I think is one of the most wonderful memories and gifts that I've got because of it. Yeah, yeah. Coming back to the fast forward mode now, your favorite match as a producer? Uh, favorite match as a producer? I think uh, there are many good matches, but I do remember uh, the match that I produced uh, was for Hindi feed. India beating Australia uh, when Harman Preet scored 171. Um, women's cricket. The, 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 that was a semi final in yeah. Derby. Yeah. So, I mean, the kind of hitting, the, the quality of Harman Preet's innings that day, and uh, the belief that we could beat the best in the world. I think that was one match I truly enjoyed producing. And uh, to see India doing well and to know that India would be reaching the final. Uh, and uh, I'll be honest that I thought India would win the World Cup because uh, yeah. the kind of innings that Harman Preet played, I think you just had to be in that moment to experience what it was. Uh, 115 balls, 171 against uh, the best team in the world. Yeah. Undoubtedly, yeah. I think that gave me immense satisfaction. I mean, I've produced men's cricket and I've, I've produced 
uh, few memorable matches there as well, but nothing comes close to the yeah. Harman Preet and Harman Preet top one hundred and seventy. Yeah, it was a sort of Kapil Dev one seventy five moment for our generation. We've been been used to hearing the stories of Kapil Dev hitting one hundred and seventy five against Zimbabwe, yeah, yeah. and then this this moment, which we which you clearly saw, is one mm-hmm. that we cannot forget. Now coming on to the near future predictions, I would want uh, specific predictions, if possible, from your end. What will be the final score line mm-hmm. of the England India Test series? Okay, uh, I expect it to be two all because I think nothing separates these two teams. Uh, I know it's going to be a little difficult for India uh, after yeah. the kind of loss that that. that Uh, we had at Headingley, but I do expect team to bounce back. I would ideally want it to be two one in India's favour, but uh, England at home is a little challenging, and with the kind of form that Joe Root is in, uh, let me just put it this way: if Joe Root, if India gets Joe Root out four times before the score of fifty, then India would win it three one. But if that's not the case, he gets on to a big hundred. Then I think it's going to be a little difficult for India to uh, come back. So I think two two uh, or two one in favor of India. Joe Root at the moment is scoring runs like someone has told him. This is the final year of Test cricket, and you can play all that you want this year, but you will not get to play it next year. Someone needs to whisper in his ears: No, you can play Test cricket. Just leave India for now. Don't score so many runs in one series. But yeah, looking at uh, the teams and their form right now, it doesn't seem like there will be a draw given the bowlers and how they are taking twenty wickets in every Test. It seems like it's not going to be a draw. Who do you think is and then this I am telling with the context that you are currently working on the Caribbean Premier League. Who do you think is going to win the CPL this year? Well, that's a very good question because what has been happening in the CPL is the uh, favorite team is somehow falling short. Like uh, Guyana Amazon Warriors is beating Zimbabwe in the first game, so. Again, this is one of the most open tournaments. There are no clear favorites, but I would ideally want Guyana Amazon Warriors to win because simply because they have uh, been runners up five times in seven years. So uh, I think they deserve to win one. They have a good unit uh, led by Nicholas Puran, one of the best young batsmen uh, in the nation. Uh, The Shimran Hitmeyer in Bayern Amazon Warriors, Ibran Tahir is there, so I think they have the team to lift the title. Uh, but you know, Trinbago Knight Riders uh, are, are very very strong. They've won uh, you know, three of the last four uh, titles. So I think uh, I would want Bayern Amazon Warriors to win because they have quality in their side. But uh, Trinbago are the favourites. I could see that glimpse of the producer's storytelling bias when you were talking about Guyana Warriors, since they have been the runner-ups, and these are the kind of stories we love as well for a team who hasn't been able to clinch victory to finally go on and win, and that's something that will be great to watch as well. Now, speaking of CPL, we have to come to the second leg of IPL as well. When the tournament was halted back in May, we had four teams. And do you see those four ending up in those spots by the end of the group stages this year? Well, I think uh, it all depends on the momentum. Uh, it takes a couple of games to get back your momentum or to lose it completely. We have seen instances in the past where uh, I remember Kolkata Knight Riders in 2014. They were languishing at the bottom of the table, winning just two matches uh, out of the first seven. But somehow they went on to win the next seven, and thereby finishing as table toppers and went on to win uh, the title. So, what I'm trying to tell you is that it's very important for the teams to find their best eleven, to find the balance. Is for the uh, batsmen to get the runs, overseas players chipping in. So it's it's it's. 
that factor which is going to determine which teams uh, will end up getting the playoffs uh, qualification spot having said that the top four teams that you mentioned are the favorites uh, but if some team loses momentum and we have seen in the past teams needing to win two out of the remaining five games somehow end up losing all five games or teams needing to win seven on seven they have done it in the past so it's all a factor of momentum uh, and it's all a factor of uh, getting your combination right but these four are definitely the favorites to go to the playoffs yeah, that's that's precisely what i think will happen but Post the IPL is the conclusion, as you rightly said earlier in the podcast, that the T20 season, the mega T20 season will be concluded with the T20 World Cup. Uh, and uh, we have certain teams that have been doing really well in the recent past. We saw West Indies uh, defeat Australia the way they did. Then we saw Bangladesh also finding that sweet rhythm just, be- just before the big tournament. We have had England in India. Uh, the two mm-hmm. favorites, sort of big favorites for everyone. And then we have a team like New Zealand, who even if you don't label them as favorites, it doesn't matter. They'll perform really well in the big tournaments. But who, according to you, will be the two teams who will feature in the final on 14th of November? That's a very tough question. Uh, see, I feel India and Pakistan uh, Whoa. may just qualify for yeah, because Pakistan is quite mercurial. I agree that New Zealand uh, uh, have been the underdogs, uh, have done very well in uh, the recent past. But I feel Pakistan uh, have the experience of playing in the subcontinent and uh, have a good team. They have decent uh, spin bowling attack. They have experienced T20 players. So I feel that you know they may just qualify for the semi-finals and uh, from the other group England is a very very formidable team they have uh, good players they have good hitters um, you know when you see Liam Livingston or in Morgan Mohin Ali in the middle order Josh Butler at the top of the order Ben Stokes I, I don't know if he's going to be there or not but uh, I think England have the firepower to excel West Indies you cannot rule them out ever. They have some serious talent. They are the defending champions. And Australia also, I mean, just don't get fooled by the recent results. They may just turn up for the big event and surprise us. I mean, everybody is liking them all. But they have serious quality. So if you ask me, you want to be an Well, that concludes the, the the rapid fire round from our end for you. Just before leaving, we are, of course, going to talk about what a big season it's going to be for you as well as a producer. What are your expectations of this big, these big ticket events that are going to happen? And what do you expect on a scale of 0 to 10? How many thrillers or how how big a thrilling contest is this going to be, this whole season as a whole? Well, I think one day at a time. And uh, I just can't think about these things. I mean, we'll, we'll have to take it as it comes. But I'm expecting uh, uh, IPL to be... Uh, no, it may just come down to be... Uh, come down to a battle between three teams for one qualification spot. And T20 World Cup is an open tournament. I mean, there are no clear favorites the T20 World Cup. So I expect some high-octane action. 
some uh, uh, lovely performances. I'm expecting the pitches to be uh, good for batting. So we might just see uh, big hits. And uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just, uh, I just want the tournament to start. Uh, it's it's as simple as that, and uh, I'm, I'm sure every game is going to have a context, and it's going to be uh, it's going to have a quality uh, on display. So hopefully, every match turns out to be a thriller. But that doesn't happen. <laughs> I still expect the tournament to be um, nicely contested. Well, that's what we hope for and we hope for lots and lots of stories emerging from these tournaments because that's essentially what we hunt for as people who are related to the industry in the media sense but also from a fan's perspective we do want to hear these stories coming forward stories of the players stories of the teams and how they manage to be on top of their game thank you so much saran for joining us it's been a real pleasure and to our audience who are listening to us or watching us you, if you haven't yet, should follow Sarag on Twitter because his profile does give you a lot more info about the game, which you will, I'm sure, be requiring in the season ahead. Thank you so much for joining us on this first episode of the cricketnews.com podcast. We look forward to more action in the coming months and we look forward to you, all of you, joining us again. And if you do like our work, do hit that subscribe button if you're watching. And do stay tuned via the various podcast methods, via the various podcast platforms, if you are listening to this. We hope to come back to you, and we hope to come back to you with a lot in this season. Thank you. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed this episode of the Cricket News Podcast, and we also enjoyed your presence, and we appreciate that, and we would love more of it in this mega T20 season. By the way, if you did enjoy the episode, would you be so kind to subscribe to the Cricket News YouTube channel and hit the bell icon just beside the subscribe button? That would be really helpful, and I will just wait and see if you are doing the same. I'm not kidding. I am going to wait and see if you are doing the same or not. Come on then, do it.